Mr. Speaker, I am speaking entirely extemporaneously because I wasn't exactly certain how you would rule. Uh, so allow me to gather my thoughts by beginning to say that the Fathers of Confederation in 1867 designed a constitution that has endured for more than a century and a half. To be sure, it has had certain modifications over the years, uh, the most recent and largest of which was the 1982 patriation and addition of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. But the fundamental structure of that constitution in 1867 remains as it was written over a century and a half ago. And that fundamental construct created a division of powers between, between three different branches of the system, between the executive branch, the judicial branch, and the legislative branch. And the essential balance of power in that system is between the legislative and executive branches of government. As you know, Mr. Speaker, we don't directly elect our government in Canada. The government is appointed. It's appointed by the Crown based on the member of this House that has the majority support of the 338 members of this chamber. And because we don't directly elect our government, because that government is appointed, it becomes even more important that the legislative branch of the system provides for a sufficient accountability mechanism to ensure that Canadians are well governed in between elections. And what has transpired here in recent weeks makes it clear that the executive branch of government has failed in its responsibility to protect the safety and security of Canadians, to protect the safety and security of members of this House and their families. And so, in that context, Mr. Speaker, it becomes even more important for the members of this House and its committees to uphold Section 18 of the Constitution Act, which sets in place the rights, privileges and immunities of the legislative branch of our system. And so, Mr. Speaker, I am very, 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 very comforted by the fact that Parliament has risen to the occasion to take on its role in defending members of this House where the executive branch of government has failed. And so I hope when the Procedure and House Affairs Committee examines this matter, they will look at the totality of evidence that got us to this place where a person in Canada, a person accredited by the executive branch of government, a person with more rights than Canadian citizens, because as you know, Mr. Speaker, diplomats are immune from criminal prosecution. And we all remember the famous case several years ago under a previous Liberal government where a Russian diplomat tragically mowed down in the streets of Ottawa an innocent woman and her friend, leading to the death of that woman. And we all remember then, fine, then Foreign Affairs Minister John Manley, rightfully under the the terms of the Vienna Convention, rightfully indicating that it wasn't possible for this diplomat to be arrested and charged in Canada with a criminal offence, because the diplomat had more rights than ordinary Canadians, as diplomats do. They are afforded the immunities of diplomacy in order to do their work. But what becomes even more important in that context is that the executive branch outside of law enforcement, outside of uh, Crown prosecution, exercise its prerogatives under Article 9 of the Vienna Convention, which makes it clear that the Crown has the right to declare persona non grata any person in Canada for no reason who is a diplomat accredited by the Government of Canada. And because the executive branch of our system failed in that regard when information came to light, that this person in Canada, this person accredited by the executive branch, was targeting MPs by trying to gather information about their family in the PRC. Because the executive branch of government fails, it becomes important for the legislative branch to step up to the plate to defend MPs and their families. And that is the wisdom of the constitutional structures that were put in place 
in 1867 and why I am so comforted, Mr. Speaker, that you have made a decision to find a prima facie case. Mr. Speaker, I'll finish by saying this. It is a serious thing to intimidate a member of this House, directly or indirectly, in order to affect the outcome of a debate, in order to affect the outcome of votes in this place. We know, Mr. Speaker, in the last decade or so, that the rise of authoritarianism around the world has put democracies on their back heels. And in that context, it becomes even more important to make it clear that we as an, one of the world's third oldest continuous democracies, that we set an example for all the world to see that we will not be intimidated, that we will not be cowed, and that we will stand up for the democratic rights of Canadians as expressed in this place and ensure that members and their families are not subject to these foreign interference threat activities. So thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your ruling, and I look forward to the deliberations and ultimately to the report and recommendation of the Procedure and House Affairs Committee. Thank you very much.